welcome to this session this afternoon. Uh, I'm Guillaume Barbu, and I will present a joint work with my colleague Christophe Giraud from uh, the Cryptography and Security Lab of uh, IDEMIA, which is titled Ocean Fall, Breaking CTRS 8 2022 and Chess 2022 Infective Countermeasures with Lattice Based Fault Attacks. Uh, so this talk will be about fault attack. So fault attack is a, a perturbation of the processing device during the, the execution of an algorithm. So in cryptography, what we would do is to use the faulty output to try to break the, the, the algorithm. Basically, a fault attack is like when uh, someone is trying to count one, two, three, four, five, the people in the room, and other people are like yelling random numbers. Uh, and then the count is incorrect and you have to do it again to double check your, your, you haven't been faulted. So this is a well-known threat in the world of embedded cryptography, so where I'm from. And uh, there have been some fault attacks devised against uh, RSA, DES, the AES, uh, uh, maybe almost uh, 25 years ago. Uh, this can be done on embedded cryptography because the, the adversary typically has the hands on the device is attacking. So we can try to uh, modify the power supply of the device or try to inject some faults thanks to uh, laser pulses or electromagnetic pulses, which will result in a faulty output that can be used to, to recover the key. Um, more recent development have shown that uh, fault attacks can also be applied in other contexts due to bugs on uh, hardware, for instance, like the, the Roamer uh, effect on the DRAM cells, or access to specific registers that would control the, the power supply of the device or the clock that is supplied to the processor at a given time, with, uh, uh, which will help to reduce the power consumption of a device like a mobile phone. Also on a multi-tenant uh, multi uh, devices. So to face this kind of attacks, we basically have two kinds of countermeasures. The first one we call it detective. That is, we will execute twice the algorithm. So we have uh, the encryption here, the encryption with the key K, which is performed twice. And if the two encryption give the same ciphertext, then we are P and the ciphertext is output to the, to the, uh, to the user. And if ever one fault is injecting in one of the two encryptions, then the test at the end will fail, and we will either not return any result or return a random result or take some more definitive security actions like destroy the device, erase the key, or whatever. Another family of countermeasures is called the infective countermeasures. Here we will simply try to modify a little bit the algorithm so that when no fault is applied, then the correct ciphertext is output. But if a fault is applied somewhere, somewhere in, the, in the process, then the effect of the fault will be amplified and will infect uh, all the parts of the, of the ciphertext that would be output. So in this case, these, these faulty ciphertext will still be released to the attacker, but the fact is that he will not be able to use it to, to recover the key. This is the purpose of the, of the infective uh, countermeasure. So last year, uh, two infective countermeasures uh, were proposed to secure the deterministic version of the ECDSA. So I'll just recall here the, uh, how the ECDSA signature works. So we have an input, which is the hash of the, mes of the message to be signed. The signature is uh, two components, R and S, which are computed uh, as depicted here. Uh, so the only difference uh, between the traditional ECDSA and the deterministic version of ECDSA is that the, the ephemeral key here, K, is not generated uh, randomly, but is uh, obtained by using a, a derivation function that takes as input uh, the private key and the, and the input and the hash of the message E. Afterward, we do the, the scalar multiplication uh, of K with the point of the elliptic, elliptic curve uh, G. Uh, the comp 
component R is uh, the x coordinate of the point, mode P, and the component S is uh, obtained uh, as follows. Um, as far as we know, all infective countermeasures on uh, asymmetric crypto have been broken in the one to three years uh, after their publication. So mainly all these countermeasures here have been broken by the papers here, and they all concern only RSA. Different versions of RSA, but all RSA. And you see me coming in this work, we will tackle the two uh, countermeasures that have been proposed last year uh, to protect uh, deterministic ECDSA. Uh, now what would we using to, to perform the attack is a combination of fault attacks and lattice reduction techniques. So that was introduced last, last year uh, here at CTRSA 2022. And uh, the authors proposed several attacks on uh, deterministic, deterministic uh, signature schemes, so the, the deterministic ECDSA and the uh, EDDSA. And they used the following fault model. So a fault model is like uh, to, to reason on the fault effects. We need to, to model the, the, what would be the effect of the fault. Uh, we have some different fault models in the literature, like uh, uh, I stuck a value, a variable to zero or to all one, or I can flip some bits in a variable. Here, the, the fault model that is considered is that the faulty value uh, xi tilde will be equal to xi plus a certain error epsilon, which will be below a given bound. So they perform several fault attacks on the signature algorithm. And using the faulty outputs they gather so in this way, they can construct a hidden number problem instance that they will try to solve, and I will come back to this uh, on the next slide. What is interesting here is that contrary to other fault models, these fault models allow us to handle large faults and unknowns. The, the fault here can be random. We don't have to know really what the, what the error would be. So coming back on the hidden number problem, uh, we will restrict here to a, a certain category of hidden number problem. That is, uh, we consider that we are given that the L most significant, most significant bits of uh, random multiples of a given secret alpha mod P are null. And the problem is to find alpha given this information. So that can be formalized with the following in equation. So we have uh, Ti, which is the random multiple of the secret alpha mod p. And knowing that the L MSBs are, are zero is just saying that the, this value is less than p divided by two to the L. So to get rid of the mod p not, not, notation, we can say that for every Ti, there exists uh, one Hi such such that Ti times alpha minus Hi times P is less than P to minus, uh, over two to the L. Uh, then it is possible to, to solve this kind of HNP uh, by searching for ser short vectors in a specific lattice that, that we'll see in the next slide. So we will construct the following matrix M with a P on the diagonal, on the diagonal and on the last line, we'll have the Ti that we have from the, from the relations be, before, and two to the minus L on the last uh, line. And so we know uh, that there, exi there exists an Hi that satisfies uh, this inequation. So that means that the, there exists a vector V uh, which has the following form with the minus Hi here and alpha at the end that when we multiply this vector uh, with, with the matrix M, we'll get uh, something that is short. Indeed, we can see that if we multiply the vector here by M, we'll, we'll have only components that are less than P divided by two to the minus L, and that will give us a, a good chance to have a short vector. And this short vector will be likely output by uh, algorithm, lattice reduction algorithms like uh, LLL or BKZ. Uh, so I will 
talk now about the CHESS 2022 infective scheme. So it was introduced in the context of a survey on uh, attacks that have been made on a white box implementation of ECDSA. So basically the main feature of this scheme is that the, the private kit D is split into two additive shares, so that rings a bell with the previous presentation on ECDSA. The input E is also split into two additive shares, uh, E1 and E2. Uh, multiplicative, blind, uh, multiplicative, multiplicative sorry, blinding protects uh, uh, all the sensitive variables. That is, we have uh, X prime, it is noted X prime here, uh, which is equal to U X, U is a random value, times X. And all the variables that are manipulated at different places are duplicated so that one fault on one variable does not impact the other variable. One thing that should be noted is that all the randoms that are used to, to do the sharing or to, or to blind the sensitive variables are all uh, deterministic and are derived from the, the message which is the, the only source of, uh, of entropy. Then the scheme is the following. Uh, we compute on the left-hand side uh, first, a kind of a first version of the ECDSA signature with taking into account the, the blinding and uh, only one share of uh, the private key and the input E. And the, uh, on the other end, we do the same uh, with taking the other share. And finally, we recombine both to have a, the valid signature uh, uh, output at the end. What we observed is that if we inject a fault in the X coordinate of the point here, either when it is returned from the discrete multiplication or when it is loaded to perform the multiplication to compute uh, S1, this will produce uh, a faulty output uh, for the first part of the signature S1, which will uh, infect also the the, the final signature that is returned to, to the attacker. And if we consider our fault model where uh, the X R is uh, impacted by a, a random additive uh, fault, then we can rewrite the faultier signature as follows. And this can be simplified a little bit uh, given the actual values, uh, removing the blinding and all the, the uh, the sharing that we have on the signature, we can see that the faulty signature uh, S tilde is equal to S plus uh, UK times K minus one times uh, UR epsilon two to, to the L D one prime. And we'll see <coughs> that this allows us to, uh, to give the following uh, relation with epsilon where two to the minus L S till minus S is, uh, is known because we know the legitimate signature and we know the faulty signature. And uh, the rest of the equation will be to, to recover. And actually, this is exactly what we, what we want uh, to build a HNP instance. That is, we have the TI from the HNP instance that are the two to the minus L times S till minus S, and the unknown, which is here the, the right-hand side uh, of, the, of the multiplication. And we know that this value is constant if, as long as we input the same message when we inject the fault, uh, all the randoms will be the same because the, the input is the only source of entropy. And so we will be able to recover this value uh, alpha one uh, using the lattice reduction technique. But now we, have, we only have recovered one share of the, of the secret, but actually can, we can do exactly the same on the right-hand side of the, the diagram I've shown before to recover the, the other share of our secret value. And then rearranging the, the two operations, we can recover uh, k minus one times d which is enough to, to recover D, uh, uh, which is the, the, private, uh, the private key. 
Uh, now we can talk about the countermeasure from CTRSA 2022. So the, the scheme here is a bit is more simple. Uh, basically, all the processes are, are doubled, and an, inf an infective factor beta is introduced, which is freshly drawn at random uh, this time. So again, we have the, the same structure. We can compute uh, two partial signatures, uh, S1 and S2. But here, the two signatures are really the same, except for the, the infective factor, which is one plus beta on the right, on the left, sorry, and then beta on the right. And then at the end, we just subtract uh, S2 from S1 to recover the original, the genuine signature S. So we studied different ways uh, one could, could use to implement this, uh, this scheme. And uh, it appeared that depending on how the infective factor is distributed on the, on the computation of the signature, uh, we, we can also perform the same attack uh, on, the, on this scheme. So here we illustrate when the uh, infective factor is distributed uh, on E, EI and RI times DI, as it offers uh, protection on the, the multiplication of R times D, which can be sensitive uh, from a side channel attack perspective. So again, we obtain a faulty signature uh, S tilde, and by simplifying removing all the, the indices on the values that are not uh, faulted, we obtain the following relation, which can be simplified uh, noticing that all the green part comes down to, boils down to the original signature S. And again, uh, we can uh, see that epsilon is equal to minus two to the minus L times S till minus S times E, which is known, times K. And we, we, we notice that it, it is again what we want to, to build the HNP instance and this time we will be able to recover the ephemeral key directly uh, by the lattice reduction uh, technique. And with the, with the ephemeral key, we can recover the, the private key quite easily. So we performed some simulation to, to check the efficiency uh, of the attack. So we, we drawn some random faults of different size from 64 to 250 bits. And we completed success rates over uh, repeating the attack uh, 1,000 times. So as we can expect, all the results are, are quite similar for the, the different uh, attack uh, scenarios uh, because the, the HNP instance are really quite the same. Uh, the, only the values are a bit different, but the nature is the same. And we can see that uh, already with two or three faulty, we managed to succeed uh, with a low probability. And uh, with a 10 to 15 uh, faulty, we can reach a 100% success rate uh, when faults are, are below 160 bits. When the faults are larger, we still reach a 100% success rate up to uh, 245 bits. Uh, when the fault becomes bigger, we, we have a, a success rate that is limited by uh, 60 and so percent. Uh, as, a, as a conclusion, so we have introduced two, two new attacks on, the, on some infective countermeasures that were supposed to be secure uh, exactly against this, uh, this attack. So it shows uh, that the, the design of robust infective countermeasures is, uh, is really difficult, and when one proposes some countermeasures, they should be proven because we have seen that even proven countermeasures in the past have been broken uh, quite quickly. And when emphasize also the fact that uh, lattice-based fault attacks is quite uh, an efficient tool, as the, the main uh, advantage is that, is that it can use, uh, it, it can take advantage of large faults, which is not the case when you have to, to consider some uh, fault models like, like stuck at byte or st even 32 bits uh, of faults. And that's it, uh, thank you for your attention. So my name is Luke Beckwith. I'm a cryptographic hardware engineer at PQ Secure Technologies. And I'm presenting our hardware work on uh, Chrysalis Kyber and Chrysalis Dilithium 
which is our implementation of um, both independent and shared modules, um, as well as our work on side channel protection of Crystal's Kyber. Uh, so first, a bit of background on the status of post-quantum cryptography. Uh, so as you may be aware, our current cryptographic standards are vulnerable to um, cryptographically relevant quantum computers. So RSA and ECC are both on the integer factorization and uh, elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem, both of which can be solved using Shor's algorithm on a quantum computer. Uh, so because of this, NIST has actually been in the process of selecting new cryptographic standards since uh, back in 2016 for algorithms that are not vulnerable, vulnerable to uh, quantum attacks. Uh, so the first set of these standards has been selected back this past summer. They picked four algorithms as the first set of winners, Crystal's Kyber, and, which is a key encapsulation mechanism, so for exchanging keys securely between two parties, and then Crystal's Dilithium, Sphinx, and Falcon for digital signatures, so for authenticity and integrity of messages. Um, they're also interested in standardizing more algorithms of different cryptographic families, so three algorithms have advanced to the fourth round that are all code-based algorithms, and then there is an on-ramp for new digital signature algorithms, which will be uh, happening over this upcoming summer. And of those four, uh, Kyber and Dilithium were the, the primary recommendation for the public key operations. Uh, so now that we have these new set of standards and we know what the new algorithms will be, the real work of implementation and integration and seeing as how this affects our current systems uh, begins. So different applications have different needs for power consumption, energy consumption, resource consumption. Um, so in this work, we're presenting what we've deemed PQ-SHIP. Uh, so it's a flexible hardware accelerator that supports Kyber and Dilithium um, and can also be instantiated for multiple different security levels. So this is um, a hardware module that can be used to accelerate these options uh, so they're performed more efficiently than in software. Uh, and then we also have um, a bit of our work on side channel protection, which I'll get into in a couple slides. Um, so first, a uh, exceptionally brief overview of lattice-based cryptography because of time. Uh, so both Kyber and Dilithium are based on the so-called learning with errors problem. And on the right, you can see a basic instantiation of uh, one instance of that problem. So the general idea is if you have a, a public value, in this case, uh, a matrix, and you have a secret vector, and you perform multiplication between the two, and then add a small error, um, and then release the matrix and the result, can you learn anything about the secret? Uh, and it turns out that this is a difficult problem for both classical and quantum computers to solve. Um, and fortunately, can be used for both key encapsulation and digital signature schemes. Uh, another benefit of this is that it's easy to parameterize. You can kind of see intuitively that if you make the matrix and the vectors larger, it becomes more harder to solve. If you make them smaller, it becomes easier to solve. Um, and then it gives uh, instant uh, cryptographic algorithms with this basis have uh, reasonably high performance and we'll say uh, acceptable key sizes. Um, within this family, there actually are several different levels of structure. So Frodochem was an unstructured lattice-based uh, algorithm, um, but it had very large keys and much slower performance. And then in the second round, uh, there was New Hope, which is, was a ring-based algorithm, um, which had better performance and uh, smaller keys, but there was concern that the higher structure might make it more vulnerable. So NIST went with the, the happy in between of module learning with errors, which is what both Kyber and Dilithium are. Uh, so this is just a very high level view of how Kyber builds um, the base level encryption scheme using module learning with errors. So in key generation, Alice just sets up the exact uh, learning with error style problem. So they have a public matrix. Uh, and in this case, each of those entries is not just an integer, it's actually a polynomial. Uh, in some ring, and then they perform uh, learning with errors problem. The T and A matrix serve as the public key, so then the second user can use A and T to calculate their own learning with error style problem and encode their message inside of it. Um, so to any observer, both the seeker key and the message aren't recoverable because of the difficulty of the problem, but since Alice knows the relation between A and T, they can use their seeker value to remove the effect of the matrix and the uh, value R from Bob. And then there's just a small amount of error which can be removed during the decoding process. So in that uh, algorithm, and Dilithium is a similar structure, just uh, a different approach, um, the main bottlenecks in hardware at least are the 
uh, sampling of polynomials because that's done using the output of a hash function and you need a large amount of data from that hash function and the polynomial arithmetic operations. Um, so polynomial multiplication is traditionally n squared complexity, but through the use of the number theoretic transform, which is a variant of the fast Fourier transform, uh, it can be reduced down to n log n, uh, but it is still itself complicated. So those are the main computational bottlenecks. Uh, and then, of course, uh, once you start inlinear your algorithm, you have to worry about side channel attacks. Um, so in particular, in this work, we touch on the passive attacks. So power analysis and timing attacks are the main concern. So timing attacks are protected against by uh, constant time implementation. So you don't want your algorithm's function to vary based on the values of the secret, or else that could leak information about the secret. So fortunately, these algorithms were built somewhat with timing attacks in mind, so they're very natural to implement constant time in hardware. Uh, however, the same is not true for power, power analysis, where the power consumption of different operations depends on the secret values that you're operating on. So the basic uh, approach that's used is the concept of masking. So the idea is you take your sensitive value and combine it with a random value uh, and then operate on the two shares, ideally independently or using specialized gadgets. Um, so unlike Previous uh, cryptographic algorithms, carbon and dilithium don't have higher level structures you can take advantage of for more inexpensive masking. Um, so this work uses domain-oriented masking uh, with Boolean and arithmetic shares, which I'll touch on on future slides. Uh, so then moving on to the methodology of our unprotected design um, and the flexible instantiation of performance levels that we use. Um, so there are four sort of high-level blocks that you can split the hardware into. So you have the, uh, the memory units that store intermediate values from the operation, uh, the hash module, which is just an instantiation of SHA-3, which is used for sampling and hashing within the algorithm, uh, what is just generically called the format submodule, which handles the parsing of the serial data for sampling, uh, as well as the encoding of the polynomials, and then the polynomial arithmetic module, which performs all of the multiplications and additions used in Kyber. Um, so there are many different applications uh, that require different levels of performance. So in this work, we've uh, created a design that can be flexibly instantiated for lightweight designs that minimize uh, area and focus on uh, minimum power, uh, as well as mid-range designs and high-performance designs. So for the lightweight design, um, we use one butterfly unit, and a butterfly unit is kind of the base operation unit of the poly polynomial uh, module. Um, and then we scale it up to two and four, uh, which I'll touch on on the next slide. Um, for the polynomial sampling, all modules need a fairly high performance implementation of SHA-3 because of the large amount of data that you need for sampling. Um, but for the high performance design, we also use a uh, piezo, so a, a module that can load data out parallelly and then allow you to parse it sequentially afterwards so that you can parse one polynomial while you're preparing the hash of the next. Um, and then additionally, since I mentioned Kyber and Dilithium are both module learning with errors algorithms, there is a lot of um, potential overlap between the designs that you can take advantage of in hardware. So uh, in the system, all of the, the modules that are shown in white are designs that at least partially share resources between Kyber and Dilithium. So for instance, with SHA-3, you can just directly share because it's used uh, in both algorithms. And then for the polynomial operations, <clears throat> you can support both if you just have the modular reduction needed for both algorithms. You can share the data paths and the adders and the multipliers uh, in a straightforward manner. Uh, so then for polynomial multiplication, um, that's really the most complex operation within Dilithium. So for the uh, basic operations, you can just perform the operations separately on each of the coefficients without much trouble. So addition of polynomials is just pointwise addition. Um, and the same goes for points multiplication and subtraction. The main complexity comes with the number theoretic transform. Um, so in this case, for the lightweight design, we use one butterfly, so things are nice and simple. It's a pipeline design, and it writes back and forth between two RAMs, so you just feed it from one RAM and write through. For the mid-range design, uh, it's similarly simple. We use two butterflies operating in parallel. And then for the higher performance design, it becomes a bit more complicated because you start having very high uh, needs for your band VRAM throughput. So instead of processing operations in parallel on one layer, we process two layers at once using a two by two design. Uh, and then like many works, we use on the fly sampling. So 
As you can imagine with those matrices and all those polynomials, there's a lot of data that you need to store in the block RAM. So by sampling polynomials immediately before they're needed, uh, you can reduce the, the amount of RAM you need. If, instead of um, storing entire matrices or vectors throughout the entire operation. Uh, so then a little bit on the side channel protection of this design. So as I mentioned before, we use domain-oriented masking for this implementation. Um, so that means we split our, uh, sensitive our sensitive values into two shares and then um, operate on them independently for linear operations and then use domain-oriented mask, which is just a special type of uh, AND gate with randomness to refresh the masks for the sensitive operations. So the goal when you're, when you're using masking is to perform operations in the domain that is, most, that is linear with the most uh, respect to their operations. So for hashing and sampling, we use uh, Boolean masking. And then for the polynomial arithmetic operations, we use arithmetic masking, because that means that the NTT, the multiplication, the addition can all be performed uh, linearly just on the two shares. The difficulty of this is that you have to convert back and forth between the two shares. So you receive inputs in the Boolean domain, uh, sample in that domain, and then you have to use Boolean to arithmetic converters, which are um, large and more expensive modules and then you have to use Boolean to arithmetic converters afterwards to convert back for the final outputs. Uh, so then a little bit on the results of our implementation in comparison with other previous works. So we compare with uh, a set of the um, highest performance and best wet lightweight designs at the time of publication. So for our work, we support both Kyber and Dilithium either separately or in one module with resource sharing. Um, our design has instantiations for lightweight, minimizing area, uh, mid-range, and high performance. And all security levels and operations are supported in that one module. The highest performance implementation uh, for us to compare against is by Dang et al., uh, which is an implementation of um, only Kyber, and it has separate modules for each level of, for each uh, security level. So in order to have the most direct comparison, we use the level five security implementation. The highest performance, or the best lightweight design by Kyber was by uh, Jing et al. And it uses uh, a design that has all security levels in one module, but uses a client-server approach. So the client module only has encapsulation, and then server has decaps and keygen. So we compare against the server area um, in our figures. And then for high-performance lithium, we compare by uh, the design by Xiao et al., which has a similar approach of all security levels and all operations in one module. Um, and then there was also one previous work which had combined Kyber and Dilithium, uh, and it was kind of optimizing for a compact area, so we refer to that as mid-range, um, and that supports all security levels and operations as well. And the platform for our comparison is Arctic 7 FPGAs. Um, so for FPGAs, this is a, the area metrics are uh, lookup tables, which are the general purpose logical elements, flip-flops, which are the storage elements, and then DSPs, which are specialized elements for things like multiplication, and block RAM, which is specialized for uh, storing data, so it's a specialized form of memory. The performance metric we use for comparison is the uh, cycle count latency, uh, and that's because while we're comparing on FPGA, we target ASIC where you don't necessarily have control over the clock frequency. So for Kyber, uh, first looking at our lightweight design, um, and on these radar charts, the general idea is that a smaller area is better, but of course if one is better in one metric but not another, uh, it's not the literal area, but closer to the origin means fewer resources or lower latency. So for our lightweight Kyber, uh, that's this small blue box right there, um, we have the smallest area report of an implementation, which of course comes at uh, an increase in latency. For our mid-range design, we have similar area and performance to the lightweight Kyber design. Um, so that's the, the orange and purple designs. Um, but of course, our module supports all operations, not just keygen and decaps. And then for high performance, um, the design by Dang et al. has the lowest latency of all designs, but it comes with the cost of a higher amount of all hardware resources. Uh, for Dilithium, we have uh, this slide just has the, the performance results because the performance of signing is significantly higher than key gen and verification. But we have uh, comparisons with the, the mid-range design by Akai et al., which is similar to the performance of our mid-range design. And then the high-performance design by Zhao et al. 
has the highest performance overall, but as you see on the next slide, uh, this comes at a significant increase in resource consumption. So the design by uh, Xiaoyao is this, this purple box, which has about 50% more resources than our high performance implementation. And then uh, our, our lightweight design is also, the, again, the lowest area um, reported in the literature so far. And then for the combined uh, Kyber and lithium, so our combined modules consume about 30% fewer resources than if you had the two uh, algorithms instantiated separately. And compared to the other existing work uh, on combined crystals, their design has similar performance to our mid-range design, but has uh, area closer to our uh, high performance design, uh, and especially has a, a high amount of VRAM usage. Um, though all designs require more block RAM than uh, Kyber because of the larger um, polynomial matrices in dilithium. And then for a comparison reference with software, so we compare with the, an optimized assembly implementation on Cortex-M4. So for the lightweight designs, which are these uh, lighter shade colors down at the bottom, our hardware is between 20 and 60 times faster depending on the operation. Mid-range is 40 to 100 times faster, and then our high performance design is 70 to 300 times faster with the outlier being uh, dilithium key generation. So then for the evaluation of the effectiveness of our side, gener side channel countermeasures, we use test vector leakage assessment. Um, so the, the general idea is you run a very large amount of the operation that you're measuring. So for the case of Kyber, it's the decapsulation operation is the one that uses the long-term secret. So you run a large number of test vectors while collecting power traces for uh, some test vectors that are fixed and some test vectors that are randomized. And the idea is that if your countermeasures are um, effectively breaking the correlation between the secret values, then you shouldn't see any uh, significant correlation between the fixed and the random test vectors. So for our um, cover design, again, we evaluate the decapsulation operation. So you can see the, what a TVLA looks like for a design that is leaking information in the upper right. So all throughout the design, there is a high amount of correlation between the two types of test vectors, and so there's significant leakage throughout the design. Uh, then with our countermeasures enabled for Kyber decapsulation, uh, you see that there no leakage is, is measured. Um, and the general cost of these countermeasures is about two and a half for area and two and a half for performance. Um, so the general idea is you can think if you're splitting your shares into two, you would think maybe you would be twice as big or twice as slow. Um, but in the case of Kyber, because you need the additional hardware of Boolean to arithmetic and arithmetic to Boolean converters, those add uh, significant amounts of area and significant uh, performance overhead. So in this case, we found that the overhead was about two and a half for both performance and uh, latency. Um, so in inclusion, this work has shown how Kyber and Dilithium can be efficiently implemented in hardware for many different applications and different performance and energy needs. Uh, we've also shown the first work, or the most efficient work thus far on um, masking Kyber, and we have shown how resource sharing can be used between Kyber and Dilithium uh, to reduce the overall um, resources consumed. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Hi, I have uh, actually two questions. The mm -hmm. first is you talked about NIST and standardization on mm -hmm. what they'll be using for key exchange or what's being proposed. We know in other countries, in Europe, for example, bike and other algorithms are, are preferred for, because they don't put, put such a premium on performance. Do you see similar approaches being used for hardware acceleration for those standards, and how do you see the, the interplay across borders? That's question um, number one. And question number two is how do you in practicality see this being implemented? Do you see it being integrated with OEMs or um, I guess, how would you see it be being used in anger? Uh, yes, yeah, so for the first question, um, if I understood correctly, I think hardware acceleration will play a very big role in all of the standardized algorithms. Um, Kyber and Dilithium actually have fairly high performance on their own in software, but a lot of these other algorithms that are less prioritized for performance uh, would benefit a lot from hardware acceleration. Um, and then for these algorithms, uh, I, I do think they will be integrated into hardware, especially in the context of something like root of trust, where you need to do verification of firmware in hardware. Uh, having like a dilithium accelerator is very beneficial. Uh, thanks for that description of your of hardware. It was really cool. Uh, I enjoyed it. Um, 
I wanted to ask two simple questions. The first one is, did you say it, it supports or the hardware can support all the different uh, sizes from the, uh, from the NIST selections and the different levels? For security levels? Yeah. Yes, for carbon to lithium, the main difference is just the, the sizes of the vectors and matrices. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's fairly straightforward to support all of them in one hardware. Okay, that's what I thought you said. Yeah. And the other one is, I, I think, I could be misremembering that some of these algorithms require a source of random. Mm -hmm. And uh, does that, is the random like generated within your design or is that expected that the external device supplies a source of random? So right now it's expected you would get uh, randomness externally from the hardware. So it is only needed to see the start of the operations. Like all the polynomials are currently, per the specification, sampled from uh, the output of a pure NG. So you just need the initial seed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Right.